So we are just on time uh, for us to, to move to um, uh, the, the first part of the program, which uh, involves welcoming uh, two, um, two ambassadors um, to deliver the opening speeches. And um, I mean, just to give a little bit of uh, context, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Berman and uh, Ambassador Rawlings. Uh, we, I'm very happy to, to see you and to see that you're well connected um, to this event. Um, so I think we all have a little bit of context about this, this uh, conference. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been any major deal on security and defense in the TCA. I think uh, most of our colleagues have been working on that. Um, and we see that both sides, whether it's uh, the EU or Britain, are working also on their strategies. There has been a UK integrated review that I think um, many EU commentators were disappointed to see that the EU was not mentioned as much as it could have been. Uh, but uh, Europe is also working on its own strategic compass um, and it has to reflect also on uh, the UK now being a third country and being its, in its own uh, neighborhood. Um, and I'm very glad, uh, just after having highlighted this, this context, uh, and also maybe on, on, because one part of the title of our conference is about the global order. And I think there is extensive research and debate in academia on how this global order is changing fast, not only due to the pandemic, but we have this idea of a multiplex as well that Ashaya has described, which means that also the modernity and the model that the West wanted to, and especially normative power Europe, wanted to, to uh, disseminate, if you want, is only one mod model amongst others. And there are multiple modernities available to the rest of the world. So it would be also interesting in, in relation to this approach to understand also how uh, uh, the EU, France and the UK also um, uh, relate to, to these arguments. I would like first to introduce uh, Sylvie Agnès Berman. Bonjour, welcome. Um, you are a, a career French diplomat and uh, you've not only been a French ambassador to the UK, but you've also been an ambassador to Russia and to China. And I think you've also uh, been um, a representative at the Political and Security Committee uh, in, in the very uh, first uh, days also of uh, CSDP, so the Defense Policy of the EU. Uh, and uh, you're currently also a director at uh, the Institut de Relations Internationales and Stratégiques, and uh, you are now um, work, or, uh, on president of the board of the directors of the Institut des Hautes Études de Défense Nationale. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I will give you the floor, but what I noted as well is um, that you, you wrote this book, Goodbye Britannia. I think that also created a lot of uh, um, uh, comments and, and, and reflection as well. And, and you were talking also about the model of oh, the approach of global Britain and how um, you see you saw it, at least at the time, as a solitary endeavor. Of course, a lot of things have happened in between. Uh, I will give you first the floor and then I will, uh, you have about 10 minutes and then I will introduce uh, the British ambassador uh, to France who will react also to your talk. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference at next uh, EUK and I'm happy to uh, uh, open the session with the uh, British ambassador to France, uh, Lena Rowlands. Uh, well, you speak about uh, world order. It's more world disorder and, uh, and chaos somewhere, if you consider Afghanistan, Sahel, and uh, many other places in the, in the world, and including Kazakhstan and uh, Belarus. Um, I think it's uh, important, of course, that uh, we cooperate closely like we used to do in the past in the uh, Security Council, in the EU, in the Political and Security Committee and everywhere in the, the world where we are meeting as squad with the Germans and, uh, and the Americans. So 
uh, I, I think uh, uh, there's two main problems, and we're talking a lot about it uh, those days. It's, of course, uh, the situation around Ukraine. And uh, even if sometimes it's uh, li a little uh, theatrical and uh, it appears to be more worrying than it is uh, really, but uh, nevertheless, there's a risk of uh, destabilization. Uh, the second uh, point also where there is cyber rattling is uh, uh, Taiwan and uh, uh, South uh, China Sea. And uh, of course, uh, it's uh, for us, it's a kind of a new Cold War. And I know what was the Cold War because I served in Soviet Union at that time, at the end of the, of the Cold War. And uh, well, the question, of course, is the reaction of democracies against these autocracies. And I think uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, be engaged in a crusade. We should be more pragmatic. That is also what Joe Biden is doing, uh, actually. What is the role of the EU uh, when uh, uh, well, the Americans and Russia are speaking uh, bilaterally and uh, when uh, uh, the, um, the US is engaged in this uh, war with, uh, uh, with China? I think, at least for the EU, uh, we consider that uh, we uh, shouldn't be involved in this uh, Cold War. We should find a role, and that's uh, what the strategy towards China is about. And uh, China being considered, of course, as a systemic rival, as a competitor, but also as a partner, and uh, we should uh, find a, a, a way. And uh, as we've always said, and it's constant in the uh, French policy, we are ally we're allied but not aligned with the Americans. So we have to uh, find uh, our own way. And maybe that's where there is a difference with the, with the uh, UK. Uh, and the, um, you know, the, our president is very pro-Europe, of course. And the motto of the presidency is puissance, relance, appartenance which sounds better in French, but it means uh, uh, power, economic recovery, and uh, uh, belonging. But the question of the role of the uh, EU is very important because we consider ourselves as a continent, even if it's not uh, the same uh, uh, governance as in uh, China, UK, or uh, Russia, but we think it's the, the right uh, scale. And uh, uh, we uh, think also, well, we are writing this uh, strategic compass, as you know, and to uh, analyze the uh, common uh, uh, threats and to find uh, ways to uh, react. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have also of course, to cooperate with um, the UK as a, a new uh, third country, which sometimes is more difficult because, well, there is some acrimony and you've seen uh, that uh, uh, during all those uh, months. But we used to have this very close cooperation because we have the same status in the less, a little bit less now since the UK is not a member of the EU anymore, but in the Security Council, in NATO, we are nuclear power and we are the only countries in Europe to have uh, this uh, uh, stra common strategic culture. We are working uh, very, work, uh, very well together. Well, in uh, New York, we are drafting 70% of the resolutions leading to uh, peacekeeping operations or other items. And uh, uh, also there is uh, this cooperation which continue on the operational uh, uh, side, uh, which means, well, our uh, participation to the battle group, UK battle group in Estonia, uh, and uh, uh, also what is uh, even more important, I think, is this uh, uh, joint, uh, I never combined joint expedition, expeditionary uh, force of 10,000 uh, uh, soldiers, and I was lucky enough to uh, um, witness uh, uh, a joint exercise, and uh, 
it was about, uh, I think, the operationalization of the force. And that was very exciting and everybody was very happy about it. And uh, because, well, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, French officers and British officers working together and uh, working together every day, in fact. And uh, we're happy that uh, the UK is uh, participating also in the Operation uh, Barkhane and uh, send uh, this uh, uh, ch uh, Chinook. Uh, why we want this uh, uh, autonomous Europe? It's uh, also uh, because what we see now is that uh, um, the US is disengaging. And in fact, I think there's always been a misunderstanding with the, with the British. Because, well, they always thought that we wanted to fight against the, uh, the US or against NATO. Whereas what we wanted is to be able to defend our own interests when the Americans were not interested. In the past, well, they more or less were and they participated in, uh, in the Balkans, in all these initiatives, but it's not the case anymore. And, and they say it themselves. And uh, what we've seen uh, when they withdrew from uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, without asking our advice or, well, uh, and, uh, uh, well, first it was a disaster, of course, but the reaction was even bitter in the UK than in France, because in France we decided to withdraw a little bit uh, uh, earlier, but uh, I have seen the, uh, all the debates in the um, House of Commons, and uh, it, 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 it was, uh, well, very, very, uh, very tough. So the, what we want is to be able to do something with NATO when NATO is involved, interested, or when it's really uh, the high, uh, well, high intensity uh, operation, but otherwise to, to do it alone. And what I find interesting is that, in fact, after the AUKUS crisis, uh, there was a phone call between Joe Biden and uh, uh, and Emmanuel Macron, and uh, there was a joint statement saying that uh, the US is supporting European defense complementary to NATO, and I think it is the, the right uh, approach. So in these um, circumstances, I think uh, we uh, could uh, find uh, a new possibility uh, working with the, uh, with the British uh, if uh, if they're interested, because as you said, they didn't want to uh, discuss the issue and to put it in the TCA. Maybe it's too early, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, while well, the European defense started with Saint-Malo, and Saint-Malo was precisely this compromise, uh, autonomous operation and uh, also uh, uh, NATO uh, operation, it worked uh, rather well. Uh, we had afterwards bilaterally, of course, Lancaster, Lancaster House Treaty, which was very ambitious. And uh, well, there's some uh, projects who are continuing, like uh, one MBDA on missiles, but uh, uh, and this uh, joint force. But unfortunately, the SCAF has uh, disappeared, and now we're doing it with the German and the Germans and uh, Spaniards. And British started a new project with other partners. That's what we wanted to avoid uh, uh, when we launched the, the SCAF project. And I remember um, Cameron being very enthusiastic uh, about it. Um, so I think there's a possibility to work together. And uh, you remember there was a very successful mission, which was Atalant, uh, which was led by British admirals. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, you know, in French, uh, you say that, uh, well, uh, on est croyant mais pas pratiquant. Et je disais des Anglais qu'ils n'étaient pas euh, pratiquants, euh, non, qu'ils n'étaient pas croyants, mais qu'ils étaient euh, pratiquants. Et en fait, so they were not believers in uh, European defense, but uh, I don't know what you say, uh, observance or, or practitioner, I, 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 I don't know because they participated, in fact, in all operations. And it's possible now to continue to do so. Of course, there would be uh, special procedures, and, but I think it shouldn't be too uh, difficult to, uh, to put in place because, it, of course, we will need uh, uh, the expertise of uh, uh, the British 
and uh, also, uh, of course, the uh, capabilities. And uh, I think also there's another issue that I haven't mentioned yet, but which is part of this global disorder is migrations and migration used as a, a political uh, tool. And I remember that uh, the, the, the British were uh, very uh, supportive of Frontex and uh, so uh, might be a possibility in the future. There is this uh, European uh, intervention initiative and this is not EU, this is also, well, Europe and British is engaged in it, in it. so we have to see how we uh, use, uh, uh, with you, use it alongside with the combined joint uh, um, uh, force. Uh, it could be uh, NATO, it could be uh, the UN, it could be, uh, well, the EU, but maybe it's too early and uh, this is for, uh, for the future. The EU3, of course, is still very important. We were successful on uh, Iran and uh, we started it after uh, the quarrel of uh, the participation uh, in uh, Iraq, Iraq. And I remember that was a proposal from, uh, well, I think uh, that was the case, a proposal from uh, Jack Straw. So I think there's a lot of possibilities in the future, but anyway, and since there is other sorts of uh, wars, uh, like hybrid wars and so on, I think uh, intelligence sharing also uh, should be uh, should be increased. So, in the future, even if I'm not, I can't uh, have detailed propositions. I'm sure it's uh, uh, it's possible and desirable. So I will stop at that. I don't know. If yes, it's ten minutes more or less. I don't know. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Berman, and for highlighting indeed that uh, it's not necessarily a global order, but at the moment a global disorder that we're also facing hybrid threats uh, and, and uh, that non-conventional threats uh, are also quite uh, prominent. Um, and I would like now to pass on the floor to um, the British ambassador to France. Uh, I'm really sorry we cannot meet in Paris, but I'm very glad that you are here with us. Um, Mena Rawlings um, and um, I was going through uh, your biography and I also realized that you have uh, in your early career you were based in Brussels and you have also uh, uh, a European of course uh, experience but you have also been posted uh, more globally as well and, and one of your most uh, recent position before being posted in France was to be British High Commissioner uh, in Canberra in Australia. Um, so thank you very much. The floor is yours. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Great. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to Sarah and to Sylvie uh, and to everyone who has dialed in today. It's, it's a real pleasure to be able to be part of this event and to share a few thoughts um, from my perspective, from the British perspective on uh, global order and the future of EU-UK relations. Uh, but yes, as Sarah has said, my previous postings, one of my previous postings was in Australia. Um, and my career actually has, has indeed been all over the world. I think I've worked or served in uh, every inhabited continent except for South America. And I really bring that perspective, I think, into uh, my relationship with France. And I'll, I'll come back to that at the very end with a short anecdote, which I think speaks to the trust that still exists between our two countries. Um, but let me say a little bit about the world, then a little bit about Europe, and then a little bit about Britain. So um, just something, first of all, I think on the pace of change that we're grappling with in the world at the moment. And, you know, Sylvie talked a lot about some of the, the disorder, the instability in the world. And for me, you know, if you think about the world over the last 20 or 30 years, the pace of change, for example, in the field of technology is just incredible, as well as a sort of fragmentation of old alliances, um, quite an unstable sort of context for the international community, um, a lot of conflict, a lot of challenges to what we call the rules-based international system. I think, however, we do need to be a little bit careful about, you know, being too uh, doomy about this. Um, when we all have smartphones, bad news does travel really fast. And I think if you look at the overall trend lines in terms of human existence, we're not actually doing that badly 
if you think that, you know, 100 years ago, we'd just seen the end of the First World War and unknowingly were pitching towards the second. We just lost millions and millions of lives uh, in Europe. I think some sort of long term perspective is sometimes helpful to think about how we've come as nations and as societies and in terms of peace and stability on our continent. That said, I mean, I think there is a case to say that we've taken our eye off the ball to some extent. That's the democratic world um, as things have changed so fast. I think some of the challenges that we've seen through the COVID period, for example, on um, supply chain dependency, um, some of the issues we're facing now on gas supply and prices, um, some of our issues with dependence on um, far off countries uh, for technology around things like 5G suggest that we do need to work together more um, in order to make sure that as democracies, we can uh, stay together and keep our own presence on those issues high up uh, and leading in the world. Um, that's certainly a challenge that we're um, very seized of. Our new Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, gave a speech on these issues at Chatham House last month, which obviously I recommend to everybody. Um, and she called for an end to, to the age of introversion and an age of ideas and influence and inspiration. Um, and many of her ideas, I think, build on the British uh, 2021 Integrated Review, full title, Global Britain in a Competitive Age, the Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy. And if anyone wants to spend an hour or so, maybe a little bit more, you know, reading the full account of how Britain sees itself, sees our partnerships around the world with Europe, but also beyond, I really recommend uh, that document. Um, in essence, it is all about partnership, exactly as Sylvie has said, uh, and how we work with our friends and allies around the world to provide a bulwark against everything from Russian aggression. Uh, as you said, we're facing a particular challenge at the moment on the borders of Ukraine, where we're working incredibly closely together with our friends and allies to try to deter and address that. Um, but as Sylvie also mentioned, we have to work out you know, how we do deal with the rise of China and the fact that we're facing the rise of a country that's increasingly autocratic and in some ways hostile to our own values. Uh, we could have a long debate about you know, the different sort of positions around the world on that and where the US is now versus the UK versus France and the rest of the EU. But for me, there is a lot more commonality in our approach to China than there is than there are things that divides us. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, I'd agree with Sylvie that it's about both being uh, sort of open eyed and very clear about defending our interests. But it's also about recognizing that we need to work with China on some key, key global issues, including climate, for example, but also also some of those other challenges uh, that, that, that we need to address with a wide range of societies and countries globally. So um, we're doing a lot of work with our new foreign secretary to really focus again on economic partnerships, technology of the future and strengthening our security ties. Um, and I hope it goes without saying that you know, Britain's commitment to NATO is totally steadfast and we continue to see NATO as the absolute centre of the Euro-Atlantic security uh, that we invest in along with France and our other friends and allies in Europe as well as obviously the United States. But as the Integrated, integrated Review set, set out, it is about the Euro-Atlantic, it's also about the Indo-Pacific. And you know, if you look at our new AUKUS partnership that was announced recently, you know, we believe that by joining forces with the US and Australia, we're protecting sea routes and stability across the Indo-Pacific. And I know mentioning AUKUS is slightly risky um, in this part of the world. And um, we've had um, some you know, interesting reactions, I would say, to AUKUS locally from our French friends. But I would just like to reassure you know, France, Sylvie, everybody listening uh, of two things. First of all, the AUKUS is completely coherent with that approach that we set out in the integrated review, where we said, for example, quote, our goal is to be the European partner with the broadest and most integrated presence in the Indo-Pacific, committed for the long term with closer and deeper partnerships bilaterally and multilaterally. I think AUKUS is totally part of that. But the second thing I would say is that AUKUS isn't some sort of you know, exclusive um, initiative that means that we rule out close working with our European partners in the Indo-Pacific.
as the integrated review also said we want to work much more closely with France and Germany in this region and that absolutely remains the case um, and I really hope we can work with the grain of the EU's new Indo-Pacific strategy and explore new opportunities to work more closely together for example on the Build Back Better World initiative that we've been discussing as part of our G7 presidency and our own supporting initiatives including British international investment. So you know coming on to the EU, um, I want to be absolutely clear that the EU sees, sorry, that the UK sees the EU uh, as an organisation and its countries uh, as friends and as partners. And we want to work with the EU and EU nations on the security and economic challenges of our age around the world. And you know, we may not agree on everything and we could spend quite a lot of time focusing on the things we don't agree about, but we absolutely believe uh, in our core principles that we all share of freedom, democracy and liberty. And as France takes on the presidency, as Sylvie's mentioned, you know, we really wish France the best of luck and look forward to working really closely with France in that presidency role on some of the challenges that we face. Um, moving on a bit more specifically to France. So I've been in this job for four months. It's been quite lively, as they say, nice British understatement there. Um, and clearly, you know, how we develop our relationship with the EU is an important factor of our relationship with France. Um, and yes, there have been uh, some difficulties, obviously, in implementing both the trade and cooperation agreement and also the withdrawal agreement, particularly around fish and the Northern Ireland protocol, which I don't propose to go into in detail in this session, which is about the global order. But I would just say that, you know, negotiations and discussions continue uh, on the Northern Ireland protocol. Um, I believe Mr. Sefcovic is in London today, talk, or in Chevening today, rather, talking to our foreign secretary. And obviously on fish, uh, we have reached um, a resolution on most of the outstanding issues uh, with ongoing discussions continuing with our French partners. Um, I think Sylvie touched helpfully on illegal migration as being another area which gets an awful lot of attention, an awful lot of headlines. But behind the scenes, it's one of the areas where we're working most closely with France to try to tackle this sort of hideous scourge of people traffickers who are sort of preying on human misery to uh, persuade people and taking people's money to come across the channel in incredibly dangerous conditions. As you know, there was a tragic um, sinking of a boat uh, it, just before Christmas or a few weeks before Christmas with the loss of 27 lives. Um, and, you know, what we've seen is a, is a real explosion in the numbers coming over in the, in the last year with 28,000 people crossing the channel in 2021, which is three times higher than the previous year. But I should say that France actually prevented another 23,000 making that journey last year. And we continue our deep operational cooperation. Uh, we're talking to France as well about how we work, you know, more broadly on illegal migration as it's a, a real challenge for, for the global order, actually, and for many countries in Europe. Uh, and I think that's sort of, you know, behind the headlines, uh, we, we, we stay in close touch. We're cooperating in many of the areas. Sylvie's already mentioned, so I won't go over them again. But yes, I'd absolutely agree that what we're doing together in the Sahel is a really important example of military to military cooperation, but also a shared sense of you know, overall strategic objectives and working together to tackle a global disorder, um, as others have said. And, you know, again, Sylvie's mentioned, so I won't get into the Lancaster House uh, treaty that really sort of sets the scene for our armed forces to keep working together. We have around 60 exchange officers here, British exchange officers here embedded in France around the country working under French command um, every day in our shared security and defence objectives and around the same number work in the UK. As I said, it doesn't get the headlines, but it's a really, really important indication of the strength and closeness and the enduring nature of our partnership with France. So I promised I'd come back to the sort of um, uh, trust heading for uh, this session. And um, I just wanted to give you two quick anecdote, anecdotes and a quote to finish. So the anecdotes. As I said, I've worked with France all over the world over the course of a 30 year diplomatic career. Uh, and every post I've been in, I've always hung out with the French ambassador. Um, we've always been really close. We've always exchanged ideas. And it's because that, you know, we share the values and we get each other. And there were, there were two occasions where you know, it really brought home to me just how close that relationship is. One was in Tehran when our uh, embassy compound got overrun and invaded by a hostile crowd uh, more than 10 years ago now. 
Um, in fact, it's probably about 12 or 13 years ago, time flies. Um, and our, as people will remember, our ambassador and his team were under attack, our families were at risk, and we managed to get people out. Where did they go? They went to the, uh, um, the residence of the French ambassador who gave them all shelter, and then whose team worked through the night to secure right of passage and the necessary documents to get all of our team out of Tehran the very next morning. I haven't forgotten that. Second anecdote is when I was in Australia, it was just after the terrorist attack in Tunisia, in Sousse in 2015, uh, from memory, uh, in which 38 people lost their lives, including 30 Brits. Uh, and I had to go to a cocktail party as news of this was breaking uh, with our, hosted by our Australian friends, who obviously we are very close to, but it was the French ambassador who made his way through the crowd to find me and to say, I've just heard what's happened. You know, I'm so sorry. Is there anything we can do? We're here for you. And when the terrible French, uh, attacks happened on French soil during my time in Australia, you know, I absolutely did the same thing. Uh, and those things to me really speak to trust and, and the relationship that we have. And that is at the heart, the beating heart of UK-France relations and will continue to be so. Finally, I've got a quote, uh, une citation, as we say in French, and it's from Antoine Saint-Exupéry, who wrote uh, The Little Prince, Le Petit Prince, as many of you will know. And the quote says, Aimer, ce n'est pas se regarder l'un l'autre, se regarder ensemble dans la même direction. C'est-à-dire, that's to say, uh, essentially, that love is not to looking, not, not looking at each other, gazing at each other, one to the other. It's um, standing together, looking outwards in the same direction. And when I think about the UK and France and the UK and Europe, that quote absolutely sums it up for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mena. Uh, it's very refreshing to hear both of you and 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 the last quotes also that yeah, that you brought to the conversation. I, it's it's quite positive because we we hear, of course, as you said, it's it's a shame that these stories do not make it to the headlines, and and we just uh, stuck with kind of um, highly politicized uh, context at the moment where distrust uh, makes the headlines. So thank you uh, very much to both of you. And um, I think uh, we have just about the time to take a few questions. Um, so I see um, that there was a reaction. So I, there is a in the chat, and I would encourage the audience also to, to type in um, their uh, question uh, to Sylvie Berman and Mana Francis. Uh, the first one I see is from uh, one of our academic colleague towards uh, Sylvie on um, uh, wondering, and I think that's what you said, that uh, what the confrontation between the US and China can be qualified as a sort of new uh, Cold War. Um, and the question um, that our colleague Manuel Dorian Soulier has is uh, to know how someone who lived uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the old Cold War from the inside would compare both uh, confrontations and do you see similarities or differences? Um, and how would you compare the role of Western Europe and the UK in the historical Cold War and the current confrontation? And I would have, um, personally, if I may uh, abuse my position of, of chair, uh, a question as well uh, for um, um, Mena Francis. Uh, and it's really also, I mean, you said you've been four months um, uh, in, in Paris and it's been very lively, but I assume also, uh, I'd like to have your personal reflection as well on how uh, the pandemic, but also Brexit has really also changed your work as a diplomat, because uh, I think this, um, we are just living in times where we need to be prepared for anything. <laughs> and it seems that uh, diplomacy has been, and diplomatic work has been importantly impacted uh, by these events. So I, I'd like also to hear your personal uh, reflection on that. Um, so if you could maybe take a first round, uh, so answer these two first questions and we'll take another round. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah. Well, the comparison with the old Cold War and the new Cold War, I think is that, uh, well, the uh, uh, well, the old one was all about uh, uh, well, uh, missiles, uh, nuclear and ideology because there was a real rivalry between uh, democracies and, uh, uh, and uh, communism. 
Uh, but the uh, uh, Soviet Union was not involved in the uh, global economy, so it was totally, uh, totally different. And maybe, uh, well, it's not maybe, it's sure that uh, Soviet Union was not as strong as uh, we thought it, uh, it was. So now it's different because uh, China is, uh, is stronger, of course. And this new uh, war is about, is multidimensional, as I said, and it's about everything. I mean, it's about economy, it's about technology, which is even worse. It didn't really exist at that time. And that's uh, uh, the war of the future in a certain way. It's, I hope it won't be really military, even if there is a competition, uh, of course. And it's also ideological, but I think it's not, uh, uh, well, uh, China wants uh, to change the system of other countries. They don't care about our regimes, our system. They can uh, live with the democracies, they can live with uh, uh, other autocracies and even, uh, well, tyrants and even, well, with everybody in the world. They absolutely don't care about that. And uh, what they don't want is to import our values in China. And that's very important because the most important for them is the uh, domestic situation. Uh, whereas they, there is on the part of uh, the US this ideological point, because of course, uh, well, there is this uh, so-called alliance of, democ of democracies and the illusion that uh, they, can they can change a country. I think it's, it is impossible. I think China has its own model. I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's much tougher than it used to be, even when I was there a few, a few years ago, which is a, a pity, but I don't think we can't change them internally. But I think it's very important to have this cooperation. And by the way, our relationship with with Soviet Union was much better than it is now with Russia. So it is a paradox. And I think, well, I'm happy that there are those discussions. Of course, it's very complicated, and uh, but it's the only way. We can't just decide to isolate completely a country and uh, sanction it and hope that uh, we have a solution if we have uh, if there's a crisis, you have, oh, to, you have to talk with the, uh, your adversary, and uh, so that's the uh, that's the only way. There's only diplomacy and uh, dialogue. Thank you, Mena. The floor is yours. Mena, can you? Hello. I don't know if I'm being heard. Yeah, you're back. Yes, Mena, would you like to, to take the question um, also on the impact on, on your daily work as a diplomat? And then later on, I will ask also Colin Grant to come to the screen. He has a question on, on public sphere and disinformation. But please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, we lost you there. I don't know if it was me or you. So, but, but I hope you can hear me and I'm, I'm back. So, you know, the way diplomacy has changed over my career is just extraordinary. Let me just sort of say that first of all, and I'm sure Sylvie would, would recognize a lot of this um, as well. And I've just sort of quickly jotted down, you know, sort of five ways in which it's, it, it's, it's changed. I think the first thing is the level of predictability. Um, just not that everything was predictable in the past, but I think the pace, as I said in, in my opening remarks, the pace of change is just so fast and you never know each day quite what you're going to be facing. Um, the second change, I think, is to a much more sort of digital type of diplomacy. Um, of course, there's still a lot of space for face-to-face -face diplomacy and for the written word, um, but I think it's generally sort of more, more agile. And I think COVID has, of course, pushed us all to test the limits of virtual diplomacy uh, in ways we, we perhaps would never have expected. Uh, and I do think there will be some learning from this crisis that will be useful for the future. The third is just the pace. I've mentioned that already, slow to fast. And the fourth change is that you can be less sort of confident in the traditional secrecy of diplomacy, um, both because of freedom of information uh, coming in, uh, but also because of the sort of, you know, the culture of, of leaks that, that sometimes plague both of our systems, UK and France, but also things like WikiLeaks and all of that. So um, I think, you know, 
a more sort of open sort of diplomacy being really important, um, but also trying to, you know, having to find different ways, I suppose, to to protect information that, that needs to be protected. It's, it's more complicated, I think. And then uh, the fifth thing, I think, is, you know, in the old days, an ambassador probably would have been able to focus solely on, you know, the political relationship and security and defence, maybe a little bit on economic partnerships. But I think these days you have to be a sort of full spectrum ambassador and you have to be able to do it all, everything from public diplomacy to tweeting to Instagram to commercial work to, you know, deals, big trade deals to um, looking after our citizens. And I think consular work, rightly, is a much more important part of our role than it would have been for some of my predecessors. Um, and that's partly social media uh, and the ability of people to you know, gain prominence very quickly if they're in trouble. But for me, it's right that we should focus senior energy as well on people who are most vulnerable uh, in defense of our, British, of our nationals um, overseas. In terms of Britain and France, just one reflection on the pandemic is that I think the timing you know, was, was sort of really unhelpful. <laughs> There's never a good time to have a pandemic. And the co coincidence of timing between EU exit and um, COVID just did co cause quite a rupture, um, you know, a physical rupture in British-France relations. And we're used to being able to just get in that Eurostar and, you know, pile over to London or vice versa, a sort of wave of humanity on and off that train the whole time, you know, hour after hour. And that almost stopped for several months. And it's unfortunately stopped again uh, due to some of the travel restrictions over Christmas and New Year, which are being lifted. Hooray. So that's good news for the day. Um, and for me, that's really damaging, right? Because so much of our relationship is based on trust. It is based on personal contact and personal relationships. So part of my role here is absolutely to build that back up and to get us all talking again, you know, think tanks, business, universities, intellectuals. And there's roles, I think, for institutions like uh, Queen Mary, as well as many others in that. But we need to build all that back up and recreate a strong ecosystem to support the UK-France rela France relationship. Thank you very much, and indeed it impacts also academics uh, uh, quite uh, importantly. And I would like to ask uh, Colin, you're back on screen. You had a question as well. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, Ambassador Berman, uh, Mena, if I may, very good to see you again. I have a question about disinformation that follows on from your last uh, comments. The public sphere that emerged with the Enlightenment has changed beyond recognition. How can our governments jointly work to counter what is frequently weaponized disinformation, both on our doorstep, you referenced Ukraine, and also in our very midst. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if I may, I will add two more questions in the chat. And, and um, the, fir the first one is, uh, in addition, uh, from uh, Deborah Dean. She's, she's one of our uh, uh, doctoral students who followed the PhD summer school and, and she has this remark, she says, one could say that politics is masculine and diplomacy is feminine. <laughs> How will the change in personnel, especially um, from Lord Frost to Liz Truss, uh, perhaps help to reset the UK-EU relationship? And I think it's it's a great uh, question to have uh, today. And I think, Mena, you're, you're the first female British ambassador nominated to France. So that was the second question. And the last question um, also from for the ambassador, uh, British ambassador from Sandra Kadouri. Uh, what can you do to ensure that the UK government improve its rhetoric um, uh, and and can precisely improve this need to cooperate? to cooperate closely with the EU and France on the security challenge. And she reiterated the fact that Europe was barely even mentioned in the integrated uh, review and that sometimes Europe uh, has become, I would say, a taboo issue or a toxic issue in the UK. So first, maybe to Colin's uh, remarks, Sylvie, if you'd like to, to respond. Yeah, I think this information, of course, is uh, very uh, dangerous and, uh, and uh, the Chinese are following the, the path of uh, uh, Russia, which is uh, very uh, experienced in this, uh, in this field, of course. It's very difficult to, to fight that, but uh, we have to do it. We have uh, specialists, of course, and that's where also, intelligence sharing is very uh, is very important. So we should uh, increase our uh, relations in this uh, in this domain because I know 
uh, I visited when I was in London, the GCHQ, and I was really impressed about what was done, uh, especially, especially in, this, uh, in this field. And I don't know if we still have cooperation with the GCHQ or not, but it's important and it's important also with the EU because they, they have a special uh, cell who is dealing with this, this information and in particular from uh, from Russia. But it's not only from Russia nowadays and I think uh, other countries are following this example. Thank you. Ambassador? Can you hear me okay? Great. So just on the first question, um, I mean, I was, I, was, I was smiling to myself because um, uh, I was looking at some French words the other day and I realised that problem is also a masculine word, whereas solution is a feminine word. So, you know, there you go. Le problème, la solution. Uh, so perhaps that says something as well. But I'm sorry, I was so busy thinking about that that I missed the actual question. Could you just repeat it, please? Whether... Whether... I Sorry, that the fact that we have more women in, in diplomatic personnel right. also from yeah. the UK side could help to, to reset the EU-UK relationship. <laughs> well, you know, we all know that women can change the world. Um, and, you know, I'm absolutely delighted that we've got so many women now representing Britain overseas, which is certainly a massive, another massive change, actually. Perhaps I should have mentioned it as one of the sort of systemic changes over my career. When I joined the Foreign Office, there were two female, British female ambassadors overseas. And now we have um, more than we've ever had before. And we have women in um, almost every G7 capital uh, in the UN um, and beyond. So, you know, I certainly recognize the trend. I think the, the really good question is what does that do to diplomacy? Um, and, you know, I think the more women we have in power, the more we are seeing profile for certain issues that weren't sort of subjects of, of diplomacy in the past. Um, so, for example, you know, the UK is doing a lot and is about to do a bit more on um, stopping female genital mutilation and having a new campaign on that. You've seen efforts uh, by British diplomacy, huge efforts in recent years on ending sexual violence in conflict. And I'm not saying that we're, you know, that there's a sort of automatic relationship between sort of women in power and those issues coming up more up the agenda. But I think it does it does reflect the fact that um, over time, you know, we're recognizing that that women's issues are global issues and that if we can fix some of the issues that affect women, then we'll be able to uh, change the world. And so many of the sustainable development goals are actually around, you know, female health, uh, uh, female mortality, infant mortality, etc. And I think all that is really good. My, my personal view is that, you know, and this is where it gets a bit pejorative and apologies to the men on the line, is that there's a few things women are actually quite good at. One is multitasking. And, you know, those of us who manage to have a diplomatic career and three kids, you know, recognise that, that that takes quite a lot of doing. And in the world that I've described, this sort of slightly crazy, unpredictable uh, world, you know, I actually think that women's strengths uh, do come to the fore in that sort of scenario. I also think that, um, and again, this is very pejorative, so I apologise, but we are often natural collaborators. Um, and, you know, it comes back perhaps to that la solution. And uh, we do try and find the solution and find ways to work together. And, you know, I'm very pleased to report that Catherine Colonna, the current French ambassador in London, and I have already established a really, really great relationship where, you know, we have that trust and we are in touch frequently about things going on, you know, with a shared intent to try to resolve things. And if that's the future of diplomacy, so be it. Thank you. On this positive note, uh, I think we're just finishing about on time. So I would like to thank you really warmly for being here in spite of the difficult circumstances and your very busy agendas. I think it has given really a great overview of the EU uh, UK relationship also with a focus on France due to both uh, of your position. I thank you for your commitment to Next UK and I invite um, you to follow the rest of the conference. Um, we will, so thank you very much and good afternoon.